As you leave the guest bathroom of the delegate salons in the Kremlin's West Wing, you've satisfied yourself that Arkady Notch had unwittingly done your bidding. He had left the poison-laced aftershave for his boss to sample. By the time your jet leaves for Norway, the big man will be dead. Putin will have taken his last Botox shot. There'll be no more Ukrainian pot shots from old Chubby Chops. So, Vladimir Putin is dead. It took you some doing to get to him. You were so hot under the collar four days into the Ukraine war, you just about flew over with no more than a roll of dental floss and a wad of Halloween thrupney bungers. Though angry though you were, I'm not absolutely sure you'd get far with fireworks and dental floss against Putin. Takes quite a roll of floss for a good strangle and most of the world's floss crop is held up in Odessa, so it was good you waited. Even so, you had to use four chemical tricks to get the man of not steel, but the man of aluminium. One spray to neutralize his favorite cologne, Tsar by Van Cleef and Arpels. Making an agonist for Van Cleef and Arpels' woody aromatic wasn't so hard, but then the diuretics to make him want to pee had to be concealed in a cloud in Corridor 9. That sent his assistants, of course, and bodyguard to their own loos, while Putin took, as you guessed, the best and nearest pissoir. Body heat released the cat pee aroma concealed in his shoulder pads, and when he spotted the unopened seal of the unique bottle, Putin put the usual caution aside and gave himself a good squirt. I could go into how you corrupted and manipulated five people in the Kremlin to give access to laundry, maintenance and cleaning services, but I can tell that this is not your main objection to this overly complex hit. What's tugging on your doubtometer is the idea that the notoriously paranoid Mr. P would touch anything that hadn't been checked and vetted by his team. Well, it's not all that difficult to get someone to abandon his precautions. Firstly, Putin was paranoid all right about death caused by those around him, but mostly through their exposure to COVID, not regular germs. Second, it's the disorientating olfactory effect of so many attacking odors. Give someone three bad smells, and they won't argue when a good one arrives. And, as another touch, you took the trouble to put the poison aftershave in a bottle similar to those little Vlad recalled from his mother's dresser. Putin sprayed, and the tetradoxin stopped his heart 45 minutes later. That, by the way, was one of Rosa Klebb's favorite poisons any of you Bond fans might know. Right, so Putin's dead. His half-witted special military operation is called off, and Russia's army disappears back across the border overnight, right? Uh, no, not even if some new order came to the army to go abandon their posts. No army would willingly give up territory they'd fought over. And where, in any case, would such an order come from? The prime minister? On Putin's death, the president's office goes to Mikhail Mishustin, a former tax collector, rotten to the core, and while no fan of the Ukraine disaster, he's sly enough not to make any sudden moves. Now, 
Those of you who watched um, Master Criminal Part 6 on the manner of murder would know... Well, just a minute, I haven't actually recorded that one yet, but I've slipped behind this last couple of months, as you probably know. Anyway, in the Careful Killer's Handbook, there's a rule about killing off the boss of a large group. The killer is number two at the same time, and also the most dangerous of his gang. Unless you've already got a deal with number two. But... Here, the Putin bubble is no proper criminal organization. He's surrounded himself by yes-men, and people with no talent for the roles they've been given, not in any case that they're allowed to decide anything. You know, even Hitler tried to keep talented generals in the crew. Von Manstein and Choltitz routinely dissipate Hitler, but no major effect on the careers. On the other hand, Putin's military bosses know nothing of battle. And after his death, who was left? Penhead uh, Nikolai Borushev, a right-wing spook and political hack? He should be taken out as well. And pimple-face Bortnikov, another FSB spook, who would probably escalate the shelling of Ukraine rather than pull back. What about old Sergei Lavrov, I hear you ask, the ruthless foreign minister? A notorious creep, Lavrov would take a jumbo bucket of popcorn to a marathon waterboarding inter interrogation. But he's too much of an old dog to take on either an elected or even stolen executive position. He'd never go for the presidency. A high-end, ugly slapper, Lavrov will defend any position and survive the death of any boss. That's why he doesn't want to be one. Behind the mess of the Ukrainian invasion is the truth that across the massive continent of thinly populated Russia, the Russians themselves are happily resigned to living in rubble. Rubble of their own making, rubble of war, it doesn't make much difference. The Brutalsky Russian is famed for being able to take it all and take a lot more. They can live with sanctions, potholes, and drink their way through the failures of everyday life. Killing Putin might make for a newsworthy week, you know, what next and all of that, but it wouldn't make the broken society change into anything more progressive. Save your poison for someone somewhere where you'll get immediate benefits. And in that, you usually don't need to look far at all. Just a last word on the cycles of war. World wars are really a 20th century anomaly. They won't happen again, even if you pray on your knees, you little trouble lovers. Yet, how are you going to test your toys? Take the Javelin portable tank-destroying missile. Uh, around since 1996, they will set you back $260,000, including postage. Almost 20,000 have been made, yet a quarter have been used in test and training within the bases of the Americans that made them. And with sales to over 30 countries from Albania to Ireland, and when they get them, they burn another third in tests and training themselves. So every decade or so, you need an angry war to test them properly. If you were cynical, you might wonder how proxy wars and civil wars arise where new weapon systems can be tested in real-life war. Gulf 1 and Gulf 2 were okay in their way, but the Iraqi army didn't put up much of a fight. Now, luckily, a good, solid Western war came through in Ukraine, and weapons-making countries are falling over themselves to get their stuff out in the field. Only in test-based quantities, mind. Again, slightly disappointing that Russia has put up such a poor show, settling for wrecking cities with half-smart bombs. But big gun lovers everywhere must be chuffed to see some real field action with these almost the latest weapons. 
the impressive sight of top-down explosives the size of not much more than a baked potato melting the inside of a Russian tank, sending the remaining crews scurrying to a ditch. This section will produce a technical wish list and a score sheet for the next generation of war toys. If such things as these geographically limited wars didn't happen by natural stupidity, well, you'd probably make sure they did if you were in the explosives trade. How? Well, let me see. First poison Joe. Make Fred take a pee. Rig the aftershave. No, wait a minute. Poison Stavros' shirt collar. Cure Mary's herpes. Fat in the alleyway. Throw a vaping pen into Goma's bathtub. Just... We're about three months into the Russo-Ukraine war. Brave and feisty Ukraine threw a fat wrench into the mostly... Soviet-era war machine. The problem is that old machine is a real meat grinder. The boss don't care how many dead or what it costs. And how many, well, sympathetic armies have learned that fast victories don't last. And Ukraine supporters, the fickle, fad-munching, but easily bored West, we've thrown in a fat wad of money and rather reluctantly given a few sleek weapons. But a long-haul fight depends on funneling much more, more money and much more ammo, and a load of super toys. Do you think the channel-hopping Americans or the hungover next-morning blues Europeans are going to hold on, even when what's needed is a massive ramping up? Or even that the Brits will fully deliver when the English eternal strategy is to get everyone to fight each other. No. I'll take the H.L. Mencken cynical view that, sadly, as winter sets in this year, a cold frost will send a mist across the Ukraine battlefield. The Donbass will be a completely lost land, and by the time grain ships, Ukrainian ones, again begin to leave Odessa, the Black Sea will earn its name once more, deep and impenetrable. Uh, for advertising fans from Australia and Britain, Alexander and Sergei sleep with the fishes in the Black Sea. You won't see them comparing any meerkat no more. <laughs>